The Bible says that all things work together for good to them that love God and are called according to His purpose. So how many of you can tell me today that you felt like you were called by God this week? Okay, so the rest of you were just not doing His purposes, is that right? <laughs> if you felt at all that God was, was wanting to use you this week, I'm, I'm wanting to tell you, Congratulations, you're part of the kingdom of God, and uh, even if you had thoughts about doing good things, those thoughts came from God. And when you did something this week, well, uh, and this, this is not in any way to boast, but this is how it happens. And so I'm going to tell you what happened to my wife and I this week. We were walking our dog. Now, this is something we do twice a day because our dog tells us that this is part of the contract of having her. <laughs> Okay, and she tells us this usually around 6 to 6.30 in the morning. Uh, whether or not we have gone to bed late, she is up and saying it is now time for my walk. And she has the two collar system uh, around her neck, so when she gets up and she shakes herself, this is her announcement, I am now up and so you should be too. <laughs> and so therefore the next thing is food and a walk. We're walking our dog this week, and we come past a house at the end of our street, and there is a lady who we know uh, doesn't drive. We know is probably somewhat not all there, and that we don't know why, but just from the actions that we see, she's probably uh, impaired somewhat. She let us know that she needed a ride to take her dog to have his nails clipped. Okay. Part of the contract, see? And her dog, was, her dog was letting her know, my nails are getting too long, I need to go to the salon to have my nails clipped. But she doesn't drive. So we had an opportunity at that point to say, even with all the things that we had planned to do that morning, to say, Okay, God, this is you asking us to go on, as the Pathfinders learn, what is it? Go on God's errands. Yes, this is go on God's errands. We don't have many conversations with her before this moment, but now, at least when I drive by, she waves at me because she knows me because we spent literally 20 minutes max. I think that's all it took for us to drive down the street, have her nails, the dog's nails clipped. There was nobody else in the parlor. We had the nails clipped in, in presto pronto time. And this is not a small dog. This is a, a, a large dog. And fortunately, there was a big man in the parlor, and he just hefted her up onto the stand, and <coughs> one, two, three, the dog's nails were clipped, and she was in good shape, or he was in good shape. His name is Peanut. I don't know if that's a, you know, that's sort of a non-gender specific name which is nice. And so uh, there they are. We, we, we went, I, I'm, I'm only saying this because two things have happened now. One is we listened. Two is we have a friend. Okay, so I, I'm, I'm not telling you that story today at all to, to say, wow, look at the pastor. No, I'm saying this is what we all can do in the midst of our life. You see, we were doing the dog walk. That was our normal thing. And in the midst of that normal thing, God gave us an opportunity to do something for one of his children. Okay? Um, I mentioned in my prayer what's been happening around our part of the world with all these hurricanes and how many people have had their lives turned upside down. I want to also tell you that Linda and I went this week to a seminar that involved Family Promise. You heard about Family Promise earlier. If you can, have, just, have just joined us, just know that Family Promise is a national organization that this church participates with. We, once every six weeks, rearrange all of our, our classrooms over here, and we have the opportunity to let families sleep in our classrooms overnight for a week. I want you to know that as a new pastor here, I was most impressed by that action of this church. I mean, there are some normal things that this church does, but that's not normal for most churches. Amen. Oh, 
Okay? So uh, I am pleased that we are not normal. I am pleased that we are maximizing the use of our facility for those who in many cases, and this is so true for the people who come and visit us, those people are exactly like us, but a hurricane has hit them. A hurricane has hit their life in one way or another. Divorce, drugs, alcohol, whatever, whatever. And they have fallen off the edge. Their house has been taken away from them. And they are living in their car. These are families with children. And Family Promise gets together and says, could we please use your facility so that they can have a clean bed to sleep in and at least a, a clean bathroom to go to and a breakfast and a supper and some time to make sandwiches in the morning for the kids to go off to their schools right here in Santa Clarita. These are our neighbors. So we learned at the seminar from Bridge to Home as well, which is the other organization that now Family Promise is partnering with and that runs a shelter over on Drayton, which is off of Railroad. Okay, some of you know exactly where that is near the Saugus Cafe. Okay, that we can partner with them in many different ways to help people in our community. Now, I'm not saying that we shouldn't mount a trip to Texas. Anyone? I went to Waveland after Katrina. I will never forget that trip in these United States to see houses the size of the ones in Stevenson Ranch that were on the beach in Waveland with nothing left but buckling wooden flooring on the first floor because that 30-foot tidal wave came in and washed their houses away and took some of them with back out to sea where the sharks fed on them. That happened a number of years ago and now it's just happened again. And, and so unless you are there, unless you know what it feels like to be in that sweaty situation, you just don't know. Some of us sitting here today know what it's like to be on the edge here in Santa Clarita. And we know what it's like to claw our way back from the edge. Well, just know that there are many families in Santa Clarita who are in that position. It's not easy here. We are now the third most expensive place to live in all of LA. All right? One bedroom, 900 square feet, average cost $1,900 a month. Two bedroom, $2,100 a month. Try that as a single mom with two kids and you can see the desperation begin to happen, okay? And I'm not saying that we would be able to or are going to be able to uh, assist everyone, but I am gonna say that the America that I know and love is acting like people are acting right now in Texas and in Florida, where neighbors are helping neighbors where the young man from, from Texas A&M goes out and out of his own money buys a boat so that he can be part of the rescuing while the rain is still falling. Mm -hmm. Story after story after story like this is going to be told. The question is, will it be your story? Will it be our story here in, in Santa Clarita? Uh, I played security guard this week. Yes, indeed. <laughs> I, I can sit in a chair. We uh, periodically rent our parking lot to film crews. This week it was Hasbro. They were filming a commercial in our neighborhood. And uh, Sally, our administrator of our, uh, not our, but her uh, daycare, needed somebody to watch the parking lot for her. So I learned a lot about our friend Sally and her operation and I'll, I'll just tell you it is amazing and it is well worth protecting and we're very glad that Sally and her crew are here every day and uh, also that we can rent to film crews who bring in people into our neighborhood bring in revenue into our neighborhood and a little bit into our pocket so making sure that those two things work I learned about 
our community a little bit more. And I learned that there are your neighbors and mine here in Happy Valley who rent out their houses. And you, you said, well, Pastor, how, how come you're only just learning this now? Well, I'm new. And, and I know that there are some people even in this church who have lent out their houses to filming. And so you know what that's like. But that's part of our life here. I'd also like the neighbors that are around us, some of whom have been a little, uh, I'm not going to say ugly, but they have not been as happy with having a church in their neighborhood. What are we going to do about that church? We're having a picnic tomorrow. I'd like to dare any one of you to invite one of our neighbors to that picnic. Just because. Let them know that because we're in their neighborhood, they're family. They're part of who we are. They're part of what we're doing. And we want them to know that what is good for us is also good for them. Amen. That having a little patch of earth here is good for them. When the drop-off happens here at 9 o'clock, there's over 50 plus cars that go up and down this driveway and drop little kids off, some of whom are working in the film industry, some of whom are, are, are well, all of whom are parents who are very happy, very, feeling very lucky that they have their children here at this amazing program. But they're coming onto our campus. This week we were visited by the turkeys. If you were here on time for Sabbath school, you saw our, our personal flock of turkeys that goes around this neighborhood. It was fun. It was fun to see this, this, this flock of wild turkeys right here on our campus, uh, picking up all the bugs off of the bushes. It, it, it was amazing. This is, this is life, my friends. This is us doing life here in Santa Clarita. These last few weeks, we, we, we have been in, in the midst of, of looking at the Lord's Prayer. We call it the Lord's Prayer. But uh, as I've told you, I like to call it the Disciples' Prayer. Because it's in response to the disciples' question, Lord, would you teach us to pray? Teach us how we should talk to God that Jesus gives this instruction. Like I said, if you, if you want to hear the Lord's Prayer, if you want to hear Jesus praying to his Father, you need to go to John 17. This is Jesus now talking directly to his Father about his disciples. That to me is the Lord's Prayer. This one is the disciples' prayer where Jesus taught us to pray, Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done. Was that last week? And some of you heard Rockney. He told me when we talked about this ahead of time, he was going to talk something about the will of God. So we make this statement within this prayer, Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. In other words, we would like very much for this part of your universe to be included in your domain. Whatever you do in heaven, we want you to do on earth. But then it changes. Previous to this, we have heard statements being made about a God and his identity, about our allegiance to him. Now it changes and we're going to hear a couple of requests. And here's the first one. We know this because the two first words are, Give us. Give us. We're not saying anything more now here about God. Jesus is instructing us as we speak to God. Now comes the part of the prayer that says, Give us. We're the prayers. We are the supplicants. I know that Greg liked big words. I like big words, but, you know, supplicant has a similar piece in it to supply. Okay? So if you are the one who needs supplying, you may need to be a supplicant, which means the one who is asking for the supplies. Give us, please grant us, please supply us with what we need. And what we need is our daily bread. Bread. That which sustains. You know, sometimes as worship people, we talk about what we're going to do ahead of time. And I have made a promise that I'm going to get my, my bullets and information in early. And that makes it possible for some 
you know, uh, dialogue mentally, but actually we don't talk about this a lot. But here it is. Today's children's story was the making of a PB&J. Okay, this is the staff of life. This is the, this is the morning donut, if you like. You know, that's how I think of it. It's a whole wheat donut, right? That's why I put a little extra jelly on and I don't mind, you know, because I'm thinking, I'm not having a donut, I'm having a peanut butter and jelly sandwich. I, I'm, I'm obeying the health gurus who say, you know, make sure you get your protein in the morning, okay? I try not to eat too much bread, you know, my wife is wheat free and so I, I, you know, I've cut back a lot on the amount of bread that I eat, but bread is this thing that is at the basis of our, our eating. Okay, it, it maybe shouldn't be, but it's a grain, and uh, some research recently has shown that every major civilization on planet Earth that has ever been has a grain that it builds its society upon. So for us in America, it's probably wheat. In India, rice. Okay. Uh, if you're a Central European, barley. Uh, there are different grains around the world that people use a lot of. So bread is this thing that happens. In Sabbath school today, uh, uh, Denise was teaching our juniors about manna, bread from heaven. It's about provision. God is wanting to provide, he is wanting to sustain, and this is all encapsulated in this word, bread. I like the name of God, Jehovah Jireh, yes. God our provider, yes. Yes. Jehovah Jireh, our great provider, he is the creator, he is the sustainer, the air we breathe, remember, <gasps> take it in, inspire as in inspiration, <sighs> expire, expiration, the air we breathe, he is the air we breathe, he is the water of life, and he is the bread of life. I love the text that says, your bread and water will be sure. He's basically saying, what you need to sustain your life will be sure. I never change, says God. I'm not going anywhere. I will never leave you or forsake you. Amen. I hope this is giving you courage this week. I hope if you feel, felt somewhat estranged from God, that you know in no uncertain terms that it wasn't him who went away. It's us. It's us that always takes a step back in the relationship. He never takes a step back. He is there to give us air to breathe, water to drink, and bread to eat. When the day dawns, like it did this morning, a little cooler, 50 plus degrees, <laughs> had to have a little blanket on, right? When the day dawns, God is at work. God is at work. He is at work sustaining our life here on planet Earth, and he is at work sustaining life in the entire universe. He said it to his mother when he was 13. Don't you want me to be about my father's business? And I take comfort in the fact that he has never stopped doing that work. Amen. Give us our daily bread is a request for life at the hand of the life giver. Our Heavenly Father. So that's the sentence I want you to take away today. When you pray that prayer, when you make that request... That is what you're doing. You are asking for life from the life giver. Life outside of this, I believe, uh, this, this particular acknowledged relationship that you have with God is the short road to not life. So much baggage with the word death. So I call it not life. Mm. To be living thinking that you are sustaining your own self is to be the living dead. Solomon says, Proverbs 27.1, 
don't boast about tomorrow. For you do not know what a day may bring forth. You don't know. Agur, Agur, I, I, I put this text up for us today. I, I hope you enjoyed it. He, he starts out in Proverbs 30. These are the, in, in Proverbs, it's not just Solomon talking. It's also this guy named Agur. A-G-U-R. I don't know how you say that except Agur. He says in verse 2, I am the most ignorant of men. <laughs> I do not have a man's understanding. I have not learned wisdom. Nor, nor have I knowledge of the Holy One. I, I don't know humanity and I don't know God. In other words, don't think that I'm this wise man for saying this. But he says three words. You ready for them? I don't know. I think these are some of the hardest words to ever utter for human beings let alone to admit that you don't know. Agur has guts, I believe. He has guts to admit, I don't know. I, I don't know human stuff, and I don't know God's stuff either. So his request is simple. It's very straightforward. And I think very intriguing when, when one looks at how we treat God. Here we're in the midst of, of, of a, a teaching of Jesus about how to talk to God. So when you hear Agur talking to God or talking about God, listen carefully, verse 8 of, of chapter 30. Number one, keep falsehood and lies from me. I'm going to reinterpret that today, meaning keep me away from false news, from fake news. Please, God, please, God, <laughs> help me with this fake news, okay? I need to just, just keep, me, keep me away from it. And then number two, second request, give me neither, okay? So he's got two here. Give me neither poverty nor riches, but give me only my daily bread. Now, you know, as a, as a pastor, when you want to talk about something and, and you know that the key piece of this sentence is give us our daily bread, I looked up where else it might be that in the Bible it talks about daily bread, and here it is. This guy, Agur, says, don't make me too poor, don't make me too rich, just give me my daily bread. Why? Because if I have too much, look at what he says, if I have too much, I just might be a Laodicean. Ooh, ow, that's us, rich, increased in goods, and in need of nothing, including God. OMG. Agur says, don't give me too much. Don't make me rich, because I might disown God. Wow. Wow. Don't give me too little, though, because I may steal, forced to figure out my circumstances, I may steal and dishonor, and I put in the family name of God. Because that's what the name of God means. He's, it's his family, and if I'm part of his family, I don't want to dishonor his family by stealing to provide for myself. Very, very interesting. Just give me my daily bread. Just enough. Not too little. Not too much. Enough. So how many of us Californians can say, I have enough. This is where Agur says he wants God to keep him. When he says, just give me my daily bread. He wants him to give him the ability to say, you know, God, I have enough. I have enough. This is a really hard thing for us to say. This culture that I believe we are locked into um, idolizes the rainmakers. Raise your hand if you don't know what a rainmaker is. Okay, good, you all know. Um, 
Persons who bring in business, the deal of which causes a company to have lots of money, ostensibly, which they're going to share with all their workers. <laughs> Mr. Reagan, I don't think much trickled down. <clears throat> and shower the rest of us, you know, the thousand dollars a year. Beyond that, there isn't a huge margin of extra happiness that happens for anyone in the world. Not just the United States, but anyone. So what is enough? This is the question. Into the face of this culture of ours comes Jesus' instruction that when we pray to our Heavenly Father, whom we are asking for life, we are to say, give us this day our daily bread. Eger says, not poverty, not riches, just daily bread. Uh, I want to ask you, are we ready to sign on with Agir on this? Are we ready to say the disciples' prayer and say it honestly? Really? Just daily bread? Hmm, is that all we want? History says... Manna wasn't good enough for the people of Israel. They whined and complained. Yes, yes. And God said, you want some cheese with that wine? No, he said, would you like some quail with that manna? <laughs> and if east wind blew, this is the second time, not this particular text, that the kids were studying this morning, the east wind blew, and he blew in so many quail, there were three feet deep. That's God going, you want quail? I'll give you quail. But then those people who felt that manna was not enough took those quail, some of them took those quail as they hit the ground and ripped them apart and bit into their flesh, uncooked. The Bible says over 20,000 died because mm. they didn't have enough. They had to have flesh. Now, this is not about vegetarianism or meat eating. This is about having enough and whether or not God and his provision for us is enough. Life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Is this not American? I'm a proud American, I want you to know. Just watch the movie, Pursuit of Happiness, and you'll find out the difference. Life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Maybe, maybe Agur was onto something by admitting his ignorance. Maybe Solomon realized after trying everything he could think of that this life is just chasing of the wind. Maybe there is real wisdom in saying to God, give us today our daily bread. Maybe the smart move is to say, I don't know about tomorrow. I don't even know what enough feels like. I accept that God does know. How about saying that? I accept that God does know and that he is really good at sustaining me. I will have to trust him. I will trust him with all my todays and all my tomorrows. This is key. This is key ingredient in the sentence that we're saying, give us our day. We're trusting that God will give us life today and tomorrow. 
But we don't know about tomorrow. We only know about today. In fact, we don't even know about this afternoon. But we know about this minute. We trust him because I don't know. But he does. We trust him because what he provides is enough for today and tomorrow. Whatever happens tomorrow. Now, the people in Texas and the people in Florida and the people in, in the Caribbean are learning about their today now, and they're depending on God. You know, they're saying in Puerto Rico they might not have electric in some places for four to six months. This is not just like a blip that you get at home and you're thinking, when are the lights coming on? And five minutes later, they come back on. No, the, the, the guy there is saying four to six months before some people get electricity in one of our protectorates, Puerto Rico. How about saying that we trust God because what he provides is enough for today and tomorrow. And I will get enough tomorrow then as well. Jesus said, let the little children come to me. <laughs> Remember that story? Ladies have been waiting all day. Jesus has been seeing all the important people, you know, politically correct people visiting the new rabbi. And the ladies with their children have been shunted to the side. And now it's their turn when everybody else is done. And he says, let the little children come to me for this is the sort of person that will be in the kingdom of heaven. He didn't say that about all the dignitaries that had been visiting him all day. He said it about the children who did not know where their next meal was coming from, nor did they care. The sort of person Jesus says, the sort of person that wants to come and sit on my lap has total trust in who I am has no, no, uh, it's no big thing. They just want to sit on my lap. They want to hear stories about heaven and about eternity. You big disciples, all worried about your status in this world, in this life, step aside. The children come through. They trust me. They love me. They know that I will provide that for them. They know that I will bless them. They trust me. And that is enough for them. That's enough. This is who will be in my kingdom, Jesus said. So, children of God, child of God, are we ready to say it? I mean, really, are we ready to say it? All right, say it with me. Give us this day our daily bread. Thank you, Jesus. Amen.